Welcome to Let's Talk About It Sunday, an extension of KELA's weekday local talk show featuring a variety of subjects of local interest. This program was pre-recorded, so we're unable to take live calls on today's show. And now, let's talk about it. Welcome to Let's Talk About It Sunday. I'm your host, Peter Rabarno on AM 1470 KELA and 104.3 KMNT. And this show, this Sunday, is, is really a great show because I talk a lot about fatherhood. I talk about families and strengthening families. And we talk about ending intergenerational poverty and how we need more organizations in our communities that really empower families, strengthen families, and set our kids and our students up for success in the future. And that takes a lot of resources. And there's one organization that I have always wanted to highlight, haven't had the chance in the many years I've been hosting this show to highlight, and that's the Family Education and Support Services. You'll see them around. Uh, we've done events in Boris Park, and you'll see them around at Centralia College. And you might wonder, well, what is F-E-S-S? And, and sometimes I just call them FEZ. Uh, which is not the appropriate uh, acronym for them, but it's FESS, which is Family Education and Support Services. And I have three really amazing people today here to talk about what their services are, what they do, some of the science and and uh, the, the studies behind it. And that's uh, Kiyoki, Shelly, and Scott. And I'm going to start off with Shelly. Shelly's the executive director. And Shelly, thank you for joining us here on Let's Talk About It Sunday. Thank you for inviting us, Peter. We're so happy to be here. What a beautiful day. Well, it is a beautiful day. Well, it's every day is beautiful when you're in a studio with no windows. <laughs> so you just you just close your eyes and imagine sunshine. But so tell us a little bit about FESS and the Family Education and Support Services because I, even before I knew what what it was, I had seen it around at different events and fairs and especially at Centralia College and other places. Tell us a little bit about the organization. You bet. Thank you. It was a nice introduction, and you can call us FES. Sometimes we say FES up. It's uh, Family Education Support Services has been around since 2000, so about to over 23 years. And our mission is to ensure the health and well-being of children by supporting the adults who influence them. We know that earlier we can intercede and provide support, the more likely we are to have, ensure children have healthy futures. Well, and before the show, you and I were talking a little bit about that early intervention aspect, and that's pretty, that's one of the core principles of of uh, FES. It is. In fact, it's so important. If we can get in there before trauma happens, we can certainly lay the groundwork for resilience and how to have how to respond if something tragic does occur. Kids are prepared, and uh, that's actually something uh, one of my coworkers, Scott Hanauer, speaks about quite a bit. Yeah, and Scott, uh, thanks for joining us today. We really appreciate you coming to the studio and talking a little bit about FES and what they do. So, yeah, tell us a little bit about resiliency. Sure. Um, <clears throat> for many years at FES, we understand that a lot of the people that we work with have experienced high levels of stress. This is particularly true post-COVID and through COVID. So we've understood um you know, what are stressors in people's lives um, and how it impacts people's lives, particularly children, parents, and what we've taken that to another level in our work with the University of Washington and collaborating with them about what can we do to build resiliency in, in families. And it's come down to specific skills that we can support families in building resiliency. Uh, one of the newest projects that we've been working on is suicide prevention. We know that suicide has gone up um, dramatically post-COVID, and one of the programs that we now have at FEST is called QPR, Suicide Prevention Training, and it's driven by some of the data that we've learned. For example, um, the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction uh, does a survey, a massive survey every two years of students in Washington State. The most recent study was in 2021, and what um, came out of that study, just one of the things that came out of that study, was that about 20%, 22% of middle school kids and high school kids stated that they have seriously contemplated suicide. So we took that and received some um, grant funding that we can provide free suicide prevention training to anybody. You don't have to be a psychologist or a counselor or a therapist. We train parents and teachers and um, you know just people in the community over the last three years in QPR suicide prevention training. And in about 90 minutes, what we talk about is recognizing the warning signs of suicide, the risk factors of suicide, 
And um, and the QPR stands for what questions to ask somebody who's having a behavioral health crisis. P stands for persuade, how to persuade somebody to stay alive and to get help. And R stands for resources. Yeah, I mean it's it's so important when we're talking about this. And 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 when you talk about resiliency, what what do you mean by resiliency? Because when I when I hear the word resiliency, I think about uh, early identification, uh, strengthening a person or a family so that they're able to withstand the outside pressures. You're resilient from those impacts and things. Is that is that the same understanding when you're talking about resiliency? Yeah, and part of our research is to look at um, one of the lenses that we look at resiliency through is how is it defined in other societies, not only ours, but others. And it's just what you said. It's one's ability to persevere through challenges, one's ability to bounce back, to overcome obstacles. So we want higher resiliency in our families. We want higher resiliency in our schools. And um, we know that for kids, for example, children, there's fundamentally two uh, drivers of building resiliency. One is when they have at least one significant adult in their life who unconditionally believes in them and unconditionally accepts them. For most kids, that's their parents, grandmas and grandpas. The other uh, way kids learn resiliency is by watching it. And who are they watching? They're watching the adults in their lives, their parents, their teachers, grandmas and grandpas, aunts and uncles. Yeah. Uh, Scott, I mean, uh, you're you're really hitting on uh, some issues that are, are very important to me. I, I've spoke about it on the show often. I just wrote an op-ed for Father's Day in, in June regarding the, the need for more role models, period, in our in our society, but definitely more male role models as we as we look at fatherhood, we look at fatherless homes, and we look at just trying to strengthen those families. And Kyoki, you know, your fatherhood is, is your thing, right? I mean, that's yeah, something yeah. that's really you're passionate about. Yeah, and it's interesting how what you're saying dovetails into a lot of discussions that, that I have with my dads. Uh, a couple things that, that we talk about. One is this concept that you are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. And I talk to that about that with my dads, and I tell them, you know what that means? That means you can choose. You can choose who's around you, who's around your kids. And it resonates really interestingly in my jail class or in my Green Hill class or I'm at, when I'm at Cedar Creek. Because sometimes I'll have uh, – my classes are like 14 weeks long. Sometimes uh, the dads in my class will get out of jail. They'll coin out or whatever. And then two or three weeks, they'll come back in again. And I'll ask them, hey, man, wh- what are you doing back here? And they'll say, uh, remember when you told us about the five people you spend the most time with? I go, yeah. And how, like, you, if if you want something, a, a trait or an attribute that you don't have or that that you want, you look up to, but you don't have it, you just find the five people that have that trait. And you spend most of your time with them. You you trade them out for the people, the five people that you do spend the most time with. I go, yeah, I remember that. And they go, uh, well, I didn't do that. I, <laughs> I, went, I came out. I just hung out with the same five guys I was hanging out with when I got arrested. Okay, but sometimes when I'm when I'm out and about, I'll see a student of mine that I haven't seen come back, and uh, they'll come up to me and we'll talk and I'll say, hey, hey, how are you doing? And they'll say the same exact thing. They'll say, you remember when we talked about the five people we spend the most time with? I say, yeah. And they'll say, well, I did that. I thought about what are the five things that I want to be about, yeah. and then I found the five people that do that, and I hung out with them. And I'll ask them, how's that going for you? And one hundred percent of the time. They'll talk about how they have a better relationship with their kids, better relationship with the other parent, no matter what the situation is. And they always say, I am never going back. Well, and even maybe more important to that is not just the five people they're hanging out with, but do they become one of the people that someone else wants to hang out with? And and, and you mentioned that some of them have kids. I mean, the kids are learning from parents. Scott referenced that as well. I mean, you look at who are you know, you model your behavior after. Who are your role models? Who are you learning from? And we know it's young kids look up to their parents first. Yeah. And if they're yeah. not good role models, they may or may not look to the community and, if you, and and you may not have someone there for you. Yeah. And that's why our fatherhood classes, I see them as a force multiplier effect. In, in my last class I was doing uh, just yesterday, I had four dads. They represented 20 kids in our community. Wow. Those 20 kids represent all of their friends, right? And that's one of the reasons why I, I started, I got into fatherhood because I was a single dad. I had my daughter and I was thinking about, you know, my big, as a dad, my biggest worry is when my kids go out into the world. And the idea that, you know, I, I tell my guys this, I go, you know, we're sitting here talking about our values, what we want for our kids, the future we want. And that's why I'm here because 
our kids are going to go out in the world and they'll probably meet each other and interact with each other. And I think it's so important that their dads got together and talked about what matters most, what's the most important thing, which is what we want for our kids. Yeah, because – and and I think, Shelly, you, you mentioned this before. I, you, you talked a little bit about you know that early identification – uh, and Scott talked about resiliency, and Kiyoki's talking about being role models. It continues to go back to um, prevention. And if you can build a strong family early on, then you can maybe prevent kids from getting into bad situations or prevent things like, you know, uh, criminal behavior or failing out of school and those things. Shelly, I mean, it, that seems to be a real core value for FES. Exactly. It, it's far less expensive to raise healthy children than, than to go back and try to fix broken adults. Well, talk to my orthodontist. <laughs> <laughs> if if you want to learn more about the programs offered at FES, you can visit us at uh, familyess.org. We have all kinds of prevention parenting programs and also some of the intervention programs that Kiyoki was referring to. Yeah, and I can't, and I cannot, uh, you know, uh, overstress how important it is to go visit the website and look at the programs because uh, they are they're impactful for anybody. You may think you're, and I always tease. I always say, you know, my kids live and are growing up in a, a fairly well-adjusted house, and most certainly that's not to my mm-hmm. doing. Um, but we all can learn. No matter how well adjusted you think you are, no matter what, how good of a parent you are, you can always learn ways to be better, ways to interact with kids, because the way you treat your kids today is the way they may end up treating their kids. And you. And you. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And I, you. Yeah, I, I always worry about which one of them is going to stay home and take care of me. Yeah. Um, I mean, do you, do you, I mean, is that kind of pervasive throughout the entire organization, that thought process? You know, we have a culture of supporting any adult who influences child well-being, and parenting can be a challenge, and your kids know your buttons better than anyone. You can learn a lot by watching your kids. And we're just there to help people navigate or prepare to navigate what could be some of the tough times when you have kids and understand the different milestones kids go through and what we can do to help them navigate in a healthy way. Well, Shelley, how long have you been with the organization? I helped found the organization 23 years ago, and we've been here in Lewis County since 1986. So I, I, it's funny because a couple of years ago I had my parents on the show, and we talked about how they raised me and how parenting is so hard now. Versus the way it was even 23 years ago. I mean, you've probably seen so much change in parenting, the influence of social media and everything else. I have seen social media make a big impact. And I don't know that parenting is more difficult, but it's certainly different. And we have some relative caregivers, some grandparents raising grandkids who didn't plan to spend their retirement in that way, but are trying to accommodate family they're going to take in family and they're learning more about the internet and boundaries and they're losing their role as the soft place to land and now having to be more of a disciplinary and very different role for them it's uh you know they didn't have car seats when their kids were younger they um could leave their kids in the car when they ran into a store i mean the world has changed a bit yeah i've hit the dashboard a few times uh, (laughs) back in the day when i was a little kid uh you know i I mean and and shelly uh how with fest is is it a nonprofit? is it is how is it funded how is it organized can you talk a little bit about you know what the organization is and structurally we are the definition of nonprofit. we do all we can to bring services at no cost there are times when we do have a small cost but it's on a sliding fee scale Uh, We do fundraising to help us cover the costs of people engaging in some of our services. Uh, For instance, the QPR, the Suicide Mm -hmm. Prevention Class, is offered for free. And uh, we have a cornhole tournament here in Lewis County at the Centralia College on August 5th, where we'll be raising some funds and having a great day with our families uh, at a cornhole tournament. Which is a lot of fun. I mean, cornhole is a a big fundraising event. Uh, Centralia College is always... That's, you know, I, I attended many years ago. There were a number of dynamic dad classes, fatherhood classes there. Uh, it's good that they're participating in it still. And uh, the if you want to learn more about the Cornhole uh, Tournament on August 5th, go to familyess.org. You can learn more music, food trucks, raffles. And uh, I think KELA is a sponsor of that as well. They are a sponsor. And if anybody else would like to sponsor, we would welcome you to the table. We have all kinds of ways you can participate, volunteer, or just come and have fun and play cornhole. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important. And and I mentioned that because it's it, I, a lot of people want to know how organizations are structured and, and that there are needs. When you're a nonprofit, fundraising is an important part of the aspect because you want to be able to get these programs uh, out to the community as a lowest cost possible. We want the services to be accessible to every adult who influences kids, whether you're a parent, a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, or you work in the faith community school system. We want to make sure you've got the resources and support necessary to ensure kids thrive. Yeah, absolutely. Scott, let's let's talk a little bit about the, the resiliency and, and the fatherhood. And you talked about some partnerships with the University of Washington and some of the studies. You want to talk a little bit more about those? Sure. Um, we've been working with the University of Washington since I've been at FAST for almost five years now. Um, we're working with the School of Medicine. We're also working with the so- School of Social Work to kind of understand not only the impact of stress on people, but more importantly, what can we do to mitigate stress in people's lives and, and build a resiliency. You mentioned something, Peter, um, about who are the influences you know, in kids' lives. And one of the things, we have a list now of what we call positive childhood experiences. And one of the one of the characteristics or competencies in that list is when a child has at least two non-parental adults in their life who also unconditionally believe in them and unconditionally accepts them, their stress goes down and their resiliency goes up. Yeah. So for most families, that's grandmas and grandpas or you know aunts and uncles. But <clears throat> if families, or it could be teachers, it could be coaches, it could be neighbors. So we're encouraging parents to look for those two non-parental adults who can be trusted and can be mentors to our kids. That's yeah. particularly true as kids get into adolescence. And they start participating in things even like soccer and fast pitch and, and horseback riding. When you have a teacher or somebody or a trainer, somebody in there who's not even related, who believes in you, you could just see a kid's attitude just blow up to the sky, right? Yes. Yeah, one of the strategies that we talk about is how important it is that we look for kids sparks every kid has a spark every kid has a passion and interest something that they want to do more about could be sports or arts or music for example even toddlers have sparks sparks for toddlers are things like princesses or bugs or trucks or dinosaurs but as kids get a little older those sparks fit into categories like sports arts music exploration or that they even know that they have some leadership skills and we encourage parents, we caregivers, teachers, to follow those kids' sparks, to recognize the sparks that kids demonstrate, and then encourage them to pursue those sparks. You are listening to Let's Talk About It Sunday, an extension of KELA's weekday local talk show. Stay tuned. Let's Talk About It Sunday edition will return in a moment. Okay, and now back to business. Listen on the air and online. Let's talk about it. Good morning. You're listening to Let's Talk About It Sunday, an extension of KELA's weekday local talk show. This program was pre recorded, so no live phone calls on today's show. If you're just tuning in to Let's Talk About It Sunday, I'm your host, Peter Barno, and with me is the Family Education and Support Services. I've got Shelly Scott and Kiyoki here talking about what they're, the programs they, uh, they offer. Uh, they're a nonprofit organization that offers programs. Uh, there, you can learn more about them at familyess.org. And I would encourage you to, to come over to Centralia College on August 5th. They have a cornhole challenge, uh, music, food trucks, raffles. You can learn more about the organizations. And, and one of the individuals here, Kiyoki, uh, runs, would it be accurate to say you run their, you're the fatherhood program? Yes. I mean, that, that would be accurate. That, I mean, that, and, and look, that fits right into my alley because I'm a father. So, you know, do you have fathers who, who you know, self-admit, hey, I know I can do better. What what can you offer me to help me be better with my children? Well, you know, we get that a lot because, uh, uh, to be honest with you, I have a lot of dads that come to the class first first day they're like, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know, you know, And I tell them, you know, I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm not here to tell you what to do. Uh, I believe that everything we need to not just survive but to succeed in life, we have in us already. Mm-hmm. We just have to unlock it, you know, and that right. becomes our personal truth. And that's – we can make our parent – we can base our parenting on that personal truth. But I can't tell you what your personal truth is. That, right. That's up to you. But we can talk. We can have a conversation and figure it out for ourselves. And then you decide 
you know what your personal truth is and you decide what that means for you, for your for your kids um so we have that conversation and and they they figure it out not only do they figure it out but they help each other figure it out right you know and that's that's beautiful just last night i was talking to uh, a dad's class and i told them you know really think about this the way you talk to your kids now becomes their permanent inner voice mm-hmm. And I could see in their eyes they were I could see in their eyes that they were hearing something their dad said and and I told them I had a grandpa in my class in his seventies, and he said that's true. My dad said something to me when I was seven years old, and I still hear it yeah, I still hear it in in his in in his voice and so i tell my I tell my dads in this assignment I say, you know right we have a chance right now to think about what is one thing." Because we always say things we regret or like, you know, we say, I'm, I wish I could take that back. What is something you never want to take back? Something that you want to be echoing in your kids' ears for the rest of their life, for, for when you're not there anymore, yeah. that they can still hear. Write it down. And it's some of the most beautiful poetry from guys who hate poetry. Yeah, well, you're hitting my heart right now because you make me want to cry. Because, you know, as a, as a, as, I mean, I think back to my childhood and I remember, remember a bunch of, I remember, you know, curse words in Italian. Uh, but I also remember, you know, my mom always saying, ah, St. Jude, help me, right? The patron yeah. saint of hopeless causes. My mom used to always say that. But I, I, I mean, those are resonate in my mind. But I always think, ah, I regret saying that to my son or daughter. Ah, I wish I would have dealt with that better. How do I go back and try to apologize? maintaining that 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 parental position but also admit i maybe shouldn't have handled that the that mm-hmm. way i could have done it better so that he knows or she knows that you know parents are fallible too because i think it's important to show some vulnerability even in parenting yeah yeah for sure because i want them to admit it i mean i want yeah. I, they're gonna have kids someday i mean i want to make sure they understand that you know even mis- mistakes happen even in the most w- what you would believe is infallible people in your life Exactly, exactly. And you know, that just a lot of times I'll have parents who say, you know, I want to I want to be the perfect parent, perfect parent, perfect parent. But I got to tell you, just like what you're saying, some of the best parenting I've ever seen is what parents do after things don't go the way yeah. they thought they were going to go. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you're you're absolutely right. There are so many times that and, and uh, maybe this is every parent, but I remember when when my wife was was pregnant and we were ready to have my daughter as my first child and I'm like She's never going to have sugar, right? She knows <laughs> fast food's never going to pass her lips, right? You have these ideas that you're going to be this like perfect parent. It all falls apart in the first year. You end up you end up compromising somewhere, but where you can still within compromise do is maintain your foundational value system because just because you gave them sugar, you're still a good parent. And I think that's hard for some parents to understand, right? Right. But that's the lesson. And that's the lesson we want to teach our kids, right? It's not – It's people make mistakes, right? It's what you do after the mistake. Yeah. That, you know? And when you apologize, you're showing them, dad, dad makes mistakes too. But, yeah. But look what he does. That's what I should do too. Right. And, and Scott, I bet this comes down to many of those studies, right? It's, <laughs> it's about, you know, if you, can, if you can at least build a strong foundation – uh, early on, you can avoid some really issues in the future by that early identification and addressing some of those issues with like early intervention. Absolutely. And I think um, Kiyoki was talking about something about being perfect parents. And in the parenting world, there's a phrase that you don't have to be perfect. In fact, you can't be perfect. All you have to do is be good enough. Yeah. And Part of being good enough is being there for your kids. One of that study that I mentioned that's done by the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction, one of the things that they said in that study post-COVID was that about 35 to 45 percent of middle school kids and high school kids in the state of Washington stated that they did not have a significant adult in their life to talk to when their stress was really high. So we looked into that. And what so we asked, we did focus groups with youth. We have youth that we participate with. And we asked them, we said, where are the significant adults in your life? And they fundamentally said two things. One is that they saw the adults in their lives as already so stressed out that they didn't want to add more stress, mostly onto their parents' life. Second thing they said was that they did not see the adults in their lives as being in a position of helping them. So just shifting that, just being, that's something we can do something about, right? That we can be those adults. Parents can be those adults. So when you feel overwhelmed and you feel like, you know, there's just too many things to do, 
All you have to do is just be there for your kids to listen to them. Yeah. I, you know, I agree, Shelly. I mean, in it's, it's about just being present is so important, I think. And, and it sounds like, you know, a lot of these programs aren't trying to teach a parent to be perfect, but trying to teach a parent how to, to be exactly how Scott was saying, you know, you got to be at least there. And when you're there, there are ways that you can at least be that ear for a kid who's just starving for someone to listen. Yes. I was speaking with a dad earlier today, and he was sharing with me that he just didn't feel invited into his child's life. Uh, the other adults around him weren't inviting him, and the kids were kind of pushing back and saying, we, we're on our own now. But that's actually a time to lean in. And uh, we're there to help parents not define the culture of their family, because everybody has a little bit different culture, but to help them hone in on what theirs is and then uh, take whatever the next step is. And Shelly, are some of these programs that Fest has um, for for soon to be parents? I mean, I think it would be important. It, it probably, well, I don't think it is. It is important for parents go, coming into parenthood to also understand some of you know what this is about. Yeah, we really have a quite a continuum of care for parents, and I would just invite folks to visit our website familyess.org because there's so many. I don't want to take up our time right now, but we certainly can help parents find that resource if it's not with us we'll help guide them to that available in the community yeah and and just as a reminder they can go to familyess.org uh and most certainly you're going to want to be part of this august 5th uh centraya college cornhole challenge for uh the family education support services organization nonprofit raising money to support our community and and we talk about it so often about ending intergenerational poverty building strong families And when you have strong families, you have strong communities, and it starts with groups like this. Uh, Shelly, anything else you want to say uh, to our listeners? Uh, Hang in there. Please do what you can to be a positive influence on kids, and call us if we can support you in any way. And thank you, Peter, for welcoming us. Yeah, absolutely. Scott, what about you? Just thank you for having us. Yeah, yeah. Kiyoki, you want to give some words of wisdom to those fathers out there? (laughs) Just whatever you want for your kids, you got to be. Yeah. Whatever you want for them, you know, if you want them to be respectful, you got to respect them. If you want them to comport themselves with dignity, then you got to treat them with dignity. I also want to say that I've never heard anyone call us Fez, but if we can get some Fez, Fez hats, because <laughs> Fezes are cool, I'd be totally into that. Channel. I'm going to, uh, hey, mm-hmm. I'm going to start ordering some swag for you all. So, hey, thank you very much for tuning into the Let's Talk About It show. Let's Talk About It Sunday. I'm your host, Peter Barno, and I want to uh, thank uh, Scott, Kiyoki, and Shelly with the Family Education and Support Services. Make sure you visit them for all their resources and programs at familyess.org. Up next, Fox News Report and Fox News Sunday. 